Hello there, welcome to this guide on design, research and general development of your car for Apple Manager 23. This will be on patch 1.9 and we'll also be going over expertise and what that is. So the point of this guide is incredibly simple. We want to go through how you can best develop your car in order to get yourself a race winning car by early season two and uh, the steps that you need to take to get this done. So the first thing that I want to go through for this is expertise, because it is incredibly important that you understand how expertise works and what it is. And to explain that, we're going to go through a couple of parts here. So for your front wing, for instance, you have six different stats, low speed, medium speed, high speed, downfalls. We have brake cooling with airflow sensitivity and with airflow front. These are six individual stats for the front wing. And we kind of have the same here for the rear wing. We have six independent stats, the drag reduction, DRS delta, low speed, medium speed, and high speed downforce, and airflow sensitivity. Now, what do I mean by the fact that they're independent? Uh, I mean that by saying that the downforce stats here on your rear wing have no effect on the downforce stats on your front wing. They're completely independent of each other, even though they have the same name. Expertise is basically this number right here that represents just generally just how well your engineers understand a certain aspect of the part. Uh, this is basically how well they understand the brake cooling for the front wing, the airflow sensitivity, the airflow front. And generally your expertise then allows you to build parts that perform better the higher your expertise is. Now, currently the way the expertise is shown here is based on the car part on our car. This is a completely fresh season two so as a result, every single part currently on the car is balanced. So this number isn't that far off our current expertise, but we need to take things into consideration like building boosts, uh, staff, they will boost your expertise a little bit. So our actual expertise is lower than this number represented here. And we'll be going over how you can actually calculate your expertise for low speed, medium speed and high speed a little bit later. It's shown in kilonewtons units right now, but it's actually a really simple system there too. Just a little bit annoying to get through. But yeah, expertise is basically just how well your engineers understand certain aspects of your car. And uh, the way to increase expertise is two ways, by doing designs, which is basically designing uh, new parts for your current car, and by doing research, basically improving next season's car. There is one way that we can lose expertise, and that is through regulation changes, unless you do enough research to make up for them. But that is generally the only way you'll ever be losing expertise. Don't worry, at the start of season two, your car will not be looking too good. And I'll just give you a quick example here on the current car. So this is the current car. It's not looking good at all. Um, but by the start of Bahrain, we'll have transformed this car into something different. As you can see here, it's really bad. It kind of looks like the season one car. But honestly, again, this is because we don't have specialized parts. Once we get specialized parts on this car, it's going to look a little bit better. And we're also going to be going over that a little bit later. When it comes to design, we'll be going over a few things. First and foremost, which, you know, car performance stats do we actually want to focus on? Is top speed going to be great for us? Is the RS effectiveness going to be great? Is our cornering ability important? What does dirty air tolerance mean? What does brake cooling and engine cooling actually do? So top speed is pretty self-explanatory. It's the top speed your car can reach on a straight. Acceleration is how quickly your car can accelerate. And this number is uh, highly tied to your engine choice, so don't worry too much about it. Um, it'll be, it's also very highly linked to top speed. So your acceleration and top speed basically go hand in hand. But unless you have a Red Bull engine, don't expect to be first in this uh, category. Your DRS effectiveness is basically how effective is your DRS once you open it, how, much, uh, how quickly do you reach max speed. And having a high DRS effectiveness will allow you to do DRS overtakes more well, more easily. Cornering is incredibly easy to explain. It's basically just how efficient your car is at maneuvering corners. How quickly can you get through a low speed corner, a medium speed corner and a high speed corner. Your dirty air tolerance is how well your car is at following the car in front. Basically, if your dirty air tolerance is too low, you'll be falling backwards. You're, you'll be losing basically pace due to the fact that you're running behind another car in dirty air. And you'll also be heating your tires more. So while it is an important stat, uh, unless you are at the back of the grid or you generally get stuck in the RS trains a lot, it's not a super important stat to focus on. Uh, by season two, if you have 50, 60%, you should be good. I wouldn't really worry too much about it. Brake cooling works in the way that it helps tire temps. 
but it also has an effect on lockups and just general, uh, you know, incidents. So it is a fairly important stat. Kind of peters out around 60%. If you have 60%, you don't really need to focus on getting it any higher if you need to sacrifice more important stats. But generally, having high break cooling will allow you to run a little bit more aggressive strategies and avoid, you know, some major incidents that could potentially cost you a lot of money. Energy cooling is kind of in the same way. Doesn't really cost you anything in terms of incidents, but it has an effect on your gearbox, on your ERS, and your engine. The higher your engine cooling, the slower they degrade, because basically the harder an engine or your powertrain parts run, the quicker they degrade during races, during practices. So unless you are planning to buy a lot of new parts, getting your engine cooling up is kind of a must. Now, interesting here is that a new stat has been added this year, extra weight. Every part now has a lifespan, and we'll be going over that in a minute. But honestly, as a general rule of thumb, I'd say just get rid of that extra weight. Sacrifice lifespan, it gives you a huge performance boost for every single part, and that's going to be very important for our strategy for this guide. Now, in terms of what I would recommend you focus on, I'd have to say cornering. Top speed is nice for overtakes and just generally very useful at a lot of tracks. But your cornering ability is going to allow you to get close to a car in front, even if you have dirty, bad dirty air tolerance. So my strategy has been so far in this game to just focus on the low speed, the medium speed and the high speed cornering. And we are kind of specializing our paths with that in mind. So that is what this guide is going to be focused on. If you want a more top speed uh, focus build, you can. But cornering is still king. It was king in the, you know, the last game. It is still king here. So if you want to focus on getting a quick car, focus on cornering is going to be your best bet. Now, let's talk a little bit about that new stat for this year, lifespan. As you can see there, this uh, chassis has a minimum lifespan of 5,150 kilometers, which translated into 6 to 11 races. Basically, once a part runs out of lifespan, it gets decommissioned and you need to replace it with a new one, um, which also is going to be happening if you crash. So basically, lifespan is nice. But for the th a thing like chassis, for instance, four to eight races, basically each car is going to need four chassis, uh, four or five chassis a year, provided you are incident free. Turning down the lifespan is definitely worth it. Just have a look at the base stats here that we're gaining. They're very low. And just by turning down the minimum lifespan, we are gaining a bunch of stats across the board. So again, minimum lifespan for most parts just makes sense because the performance gain is massive. You'll spend a little bit of money on parts, but one of your goals for the first season should be to improve your factory to level three, which will allow you to manufacture a lot of parts at a time fairly quick. So honestly, don't worry about the lifespan stat here. Turning it down is going to benefit you on basically every single part, even your suspension here, which again, loses a lot of its performance, just two to three races. But again, you don't really, you don't really get into trouble. I've been running minimum lifespan parts for basically forever. I haven't had much trouble except for basically the starting few first months of a save with a team that just has a level one factory. There you're going to have to make some sacrifices and basically focus your parts that you're designing onto the better car. You can do the same with the underfloor. Again, it's a massive gain in virtually all stats, particularly the cornering stats here. And we can continue and do the same for side pods. Again, pretty decent stat gains on everything. And when you do this for every part, you can kind of see that it adds up and gives you a massive performance gain. So what I'm going to do here is make balanced parts and I'm going to be rushing them. But we're going to take a look now at what a car that just has its minimum lifespan with base parts, which is going to improve our car a little bit because of the expertise gain. Uh, but we're going to be making a minimum lifespan car and we'll have a look at the difference from just just this in terms of performance. The only car part you might want to give a little bit of extra lifespan could be the front wings here. Just a couple of sliders to the right will allow it to survive two to four races. Front wings though are fragile, so honestly, I wouldn't go anything higher than this, but it will allow you to, as I said, get a little bit extra life into it, but you do sacrifice some cornering ability. For now, let's have a look at our current car, and then we'll have a look at a minimum lifespan car with, you know, no other changes. Sliders will all be in the middle. So that was the wrong place, excuse me. But yeah, this is our current car. Not really good at all. And again, we're just going to put in minimum lifespan and then we'll compare it to the rest of the grid. So here we are with the current car. This car has, uh, as I said, only got those six new parts. 
all of them are, have been rushed. And all of them have, the only thing that's really changed here has been the fact that we have slapped on a, uh, a minimum lifespan setup. And as you can see that even that has just vastly improved our car already. Although let's face it, we have developed parts while the AI probably hasn't, but it has already propelled us up far higher than we were before. Uh, we're still incredibly slow, but our cornering ability has increased massively already. And that is kind of what we were looking for. We no longer have any extra weight. And again, this is without maximizing sliders. So let me show you what uh, we can do if we maximize sliders for cornering as well. Here we have a car where we made all six pieces, like the same time, minimum durability, but with maximized sliders full cornering ability. We have decent stats still, as you see. We didn't lose really anything in terms of brake cooling, entry cooling. Lost our dirty air tolerance a bit, but that is still manageable. And now we have a car that is undoubtedly the best cornering car there is. We are slower though, we have worse dirty air tolerance. We don't have the best brake cooling, but again, as long as your brake cooling and your engine cooling is above 60%, uh, you will be okay. You'll actually be really good. 70, 80%. It's very, you know, the gains, the high your expertise goes for these stats. It's very little. So you perfectly plan to sacrifice some brake cooling, some engine cooling, and even some dirty air tolerance as you get a very, very dominant car like this one. Because this one car will be, for the most part, be standing for front row. And that is kind of the idea. We'll be going over the sliders in just a second, but first we're going over design and basically how you use it. But uh, that's what we might expect here. This car is fairly dominant, even if you compare it to Red Bull. We have decent gains here in these stats. Uh, the thing we're lacking though is going to be, you know, acceleration, we're on a Ferrari engine, and the top speed. Let us talk design. And the first thing we're going to focus on on the design side is how expertise in games works with both your wind tunnel and CFD, but also just how general expertise gain works with uh, the sliders, with uh, the different settings. And we'll have a look at some of the, you know, more basic slider setups afterwards in order to maximize what parts are good at. Parts will have different stat gains depending on what they're good at. Your suspension will, for instance, be your best source of brake cooling. Your front wing will be your secondary source of brake cooling. Side parts will be your best source of engine cooling. Chassis will be your secondary source. And basically every part has some things they're good at, some things they're bad at, and you want to maximize what they're good at while minimizing what they're bad at in order to boost the good aspect and get the most performance that you can out of each part. Now to do that, we're gonna have to go through, well, the sliders later on, but for now we're gonna go through, as I said, the expertise gain, uh, safety and wind tunnel, and how the two, three different modes, standard, rushed, and intense works, and generally what happens if you add more engineers to a project. So since we'll be going off the sliders later, the first thing I want to talk about is CFD and wind tunnel hours. The way that this these work are incredibly simple and straightforward. And because of the way they work, there are two buildings that are kind of a bit of a trap. I'm just going to mention it here. But your uh, wind tunnel and your CFD facilities, there's no real reason to upgrade them past level one. They have an incredibly high uh, maintenance that has an effect on your cost cap. You can only use them six times a year. So generally, just don't upgrade those buildings. It's never worth it. But uh, I'll get into that probably in a different video. Now, for your safety and wind tunnel hours, the way they work is, as I said, simple. And the best way I can describe it is by just clicking once. As you can see here, our mile hours have now gone up to 0 0.1. And each time you click this once, it represents a unit, which means that for the mile hours, 6.0 here is actually 60 units. For the wind tunnel, they translate to one. So we actually have 80 units here. So total in terms of our win and CFD allocation, it is 80 plus 60, 140 units. So the way wind tunnel and CFD works is when you apply them to a project like this, they will boost the current stats of your piece slightly, uh, which is of course nice. But at the end of this project, it will apply the amount of units, in this case, 140, that those 140 units will translate to 140 days of expertise gain. Meaning that if I were to design this rear wing at the end of its uh, design phase, I would get an extra 140 days worth of expertise. Basically, it's as if I ran this project for, you know, an extra four months, four and a half months. So you can imagine that that is gonna be quite a extensive boost, but that boost isn't actually gonna apply 
to this rear wing, I'd have to make another one. And I'll show you an example here with an underfloor. As an example on why it is incredibly important when you do CFD time, wind tunnel time, to actually go ahead and make a second edition of the part, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use this underfloor as an example. As you can see at this underfloor, the first situation here, this is where we use CFD wind tunnel time, got put into this part, gives us some decent uh, stat gains across the board compared to this one. But if you go one further, as you can see here, this is the same underfloor. We just basically made it. And even then, it's getting some fairly significant stat boosts across the board here. This is actually fairly, you know, impressive, fairly good. And as a result, whenever you do use safety of wind tunnel time to get the maximum out of it, you actually need to make two designs. First one design where you put in the safety wind tunnel time. And once that design is complete, the units then you put into it, in our case we have 140, 140 days worth of expertise, gets applied to your expertise stats, and then you need to make a final edition, so to speak, of whatever part you are making in order to get the most out of your internal and CFD time. Next thing we want to talk about on the sign here is your engineers and your approach and what these two things do. So your engineers actually just speeds up a project. You can add a total of six, and it takes off about a third of uh, the total time. In this case, we had uh, 43 days. Now it's down to 29. And basically, again, it just speeds up the project. But it does have an effect on your expertise. Speeding up a project means that you'll get a higher daily expertise gain. But you'll get lower total expertise. Basically, at the end of these 29 days, I'll get less expertise than if I allowed it to run for the full 43 days. You'll get more daily expertise by running it 29 days. But, again, it's uh, less total than allowing it to run for 43, which probably sounds a little bit weird. But if you were to, say, start another project right away, this would give you more expertise. But it's going to be more expensive because you're running projects, you know, more rapidly. So if you want to efficiently gain expertise, or rather get the most bang for your buck for your design and research project, just use one engineer. If you want to speed them up, that's fine. Just make sure you can actually afford it. Now, the way the approach works is incredibly simple. Normal is just normal. They do things like they would do normally. If you do rushed, it does the same thing as putting in extra engineers. It cuts the time down by about a third, but it increases the cost. Basically, the project becomes one and a half times more expensive, and that does have an effect on your cost cap. Now, intense, on the other hand, it remains at the same amount of time, but they do put in extra amount of expertise work. The cost is quite a lot higher. As you can see, it's about uh, three times as high, which of course isn't great because the only thing that you actually get from this is a 1.5 time expertise gain, but it kind of scales. So if you have very low expertise, 30, 40%, doing your first project on intense can be somewhat worth it. But keep in mind again, this is the same as running three projects in terms of cost, but you only get one and a half times worth in terms of expertise gain. So. In 22, this was very, very powerful. I did uh, kind of advocate towards this at the start of this game too, because I expected it to kind of work the same. But currently, I don't really use Intense ever, so I wouldn't really recommend it. Rush can be incredibly powerful to use to get parts out when you really, really need them before a race or at the start of a season, but I generally don't use this either. I would recommend, for the most part, again, just a single engineer, or if you need to get project done quickly, use your engineers first, and then rushed if you really need to. Doesn't really cost you anything to use your engineers for these projects, so use them freely. Now we're going to go over each car part and generally just how I would place the sliders in order to get the performance that I was shown earlier. Now keep in mind that your sliders might have some, you know, uh, worrisome parts like you don't want your engine cooling to drop too low, you don't want your brake cooling to drop too low. If any of these really drop too low 50% in your second season, you're kind of in trouble. Any of these below 40% in your first season, you might be in trouble. So try and keep them somewhat high. And if you need to make some sacrifices into your cornering ability, that is fine. But it's something that you need to keep an eye on. So the first thing you should do for every part is, as I said, minimum lifespan. It's just a ton more um, performance for no cost. And for the uh, chassis here, it is actually incredibly powerful in terms of getting some top speed. But it's far more powerful in terms of getting that high speed and medium speed cornering which is kind of what I like to focus this chassis on. If I were to make a chassis, it's usually going to look like this, provided that the engine cooling remains high enough. And keep in mind, the chassis isn't your best source of engine cooling. 
your side pods are. So the 3% loss here can be made up with the side pods. We are going to be losing top speed on basically every single part with this setup. But as you can see, this is already major gains here in terms of cornering ability. And your chassis is a huge source of medium speed cornering and high speed cornering ability. Next up, we're going to have a quick look at the side pods because as I said, you can actually make up for the engine cooling here. And here we're going to do the same thing. Minimum lifespan it is just the best thing. And we do want to maximize engine cooling. We are still focusing on, uh, you know, our cornering ability. So we're going to sacrifice top speed. Your side pods don't really have a huge effect on your low speed cornering. So we'll turn that down and we'll maximize the airflow middle. As a result, as you can see, we gain an extra 8.41% engine cooling. So with these two parts, the chassis and the side pods, Again, sideboard more than makes up for it, but early in the season, you might have to do a little bit more cooling on both of them in order to get this stat high enough. Again, it has to do with components. So if you're in a financial good spot, having crashed a lot, you can, you know, play it a little bit risky, but generally I'd recommend to get this up to 50, 60% as quickly as possible. And again, decent amount, of cool, decent amount of cornering here, but the main thing that we get from this part is cooling. And again, if, if your cooling is very, very high, say you're starting to reach 70% or so, and you feel like the parts aren't really, you know, needing to be replaced, you can turn this down to get a little bit extra cornering ability, but this is generally what I would do in a cornering build. Now, the next thing we'll have a look at is actually the suspension and the front wing, because they have the other cooling stat, the brake cooling. So the suspension here it excels at two things in particular. It excels at brake cooling, but it also excels at low speed cornering. So you want to turn both of these up. The airflow front and the low speed complement each other. So if you maximize one of these sliders, you definitely want to maximize the other one. And there's a couple of cars that have this part. Your chassis has one, but it doesn't actually have the downfalls. Uh, your chassis, your side pods, you saw that. So basically the cornering ability comes from the airflow game. Now we do want to turn down the high speed cornering ability. We want to turn down the medium speed cornering ability generally because low speed cornering is somewhat hard to come by and we also want to get down on the drag reduction we don't lose too much speed here and acceleration we gain a decent amount of low speed cornering which is acceptable and we can somewhat alleviate the losses even more by going minimum lifespan again two three races is fairly acceptable we lose a little bit of high speed lose a little bit of top speed but again high speed is incredibly easy to come by top speed is incredibly easy to come by if you are struggling for medium speed you could do this but as you can see we lose far more of both of these and we don't really get any medium speed so for simplicity's sake this is basically the sliders for your suspension and as you can see here we get the 6.7 percent brake cooling now for your front wing which is again your other source of uh, brake cooling this is the sliders that i would go for is airflow front because again front wing low speed cornering for the most part the lifespan i would go i usually just go with minimum but it is perfectly fine to just do it two ticks to the right to get two to four, lose a little bit of performance, but honestly, it's not a big deal. Uh, if you are, you know, struggling to keep up demand, your drivers are crashing a lot, wrecking front wings against other drivers, you can go ahead and turn this down. Now, brake cooling here, because of the fact that we did get brake cooling from that other part, if your brake cooling is high enough, 60%, 50%, depending on your season, 50% season one, 60% season two, I'd recommend turning this down to get a little bit more performance out of your car. If your drivers are having a very rough start to the season, keeping this a little bit higher, just basically, uh, you know, having it at neutral can be beneficial just to make sure that you, you know, don't wreck the car too often. Now, airflow sensitivity has to do with your dirty air tolerance. And again, if you are following a lot of cars, keeping this above 50% is probably going to be a must. But if you are in a position where you, your car is fairly dominant, it is extremely quick like we are, I recommend just turning it down. You will be losing a decent chunk of it here, but that is fine. And while you can get some high speed cornering here, we are getting most from other parts. So I would just recommend turning that down, turning medium speed up. And this is basically what you end up with. So we're still going to get more brake cooling than we have because we're getting a lot from the suspension. And generally, that's how I would look at things with the chassis and your side pod and your uh, suspension and your front wing. You want to have a look at both of them and see how you come out in terms of cooling mainly. Your dead air tolerance can be gained from three parts, front wing, rear wing and underfloor. So don't worry too much about it. It's not a big deal. But generally, you, 
are going to need some of it, most likely. But yeah, this is what I do. It's not a huge boost by any means, but uh, it's a decent cornering for both low speed and medium speed. And this is generally what I enjoy doing. Now, rowing is probably the only path that you'll be focusing on that's actually going to give you some top speed. Because your rowing excels at drag reduction, it excels at the DRS Delta, and honestly, you don't get a lot of cornering, even if we maximize these stats. We're not going to get a lot of cornering, and we are losing a lot of top speed, acceleration, and DRS effect nodes for it. So what I enjoy doing is just turning down the cornering ability here. We still get some from our base stats. <coughs> Excuse me. But we also get a lot more top speed and DRS effectiveness by turning them down. And again, this is one of those places where you can find some dirty air tolerance. As you can see, it has less of an effect than our front wing though, uh, because of the way we place our sliders. So generally, I would just turn this down, um, maybe sacrifice a little bit of front wing if you need to, because having a decent DRS effectiveness can be huge in just making overtakes easier in DRS zones. So this is how I would do my rear wing, everything for the most part to the left with drag reduction and DRS delta to the right. Now, keep in mind the guide that I did post uh, below, Mike Takumi's guide, has basically far more information on this and a few, you know, suggestions of how you can set up your car. I'm not saying that mine is the best. I'm just saying it's done really well for me with aggressive strategies. So do keep that in mind. The final part, your underfloor, is actually a jack of all trades. It can do anything reasonably well. So what you can do is maximize two, three stats maybe. You could go for a little bit extra, you know, drag reduction here. Generally, I do this, this, just focus that two into cornering. We do lose a little bit dirtier, we do lose a little bit of top speed, but again, the cornering gain across the board is for me very much worth it. And again, that is kind of the builds that I've been running for all of my series. You can have a look at them too. Uh, basically, the objective survive should be a good bet if you want to start with Alfa Romeo. But yeah, that is basically how I would run the sliders. Nothing too crazy and nothing too major. But they're basically just focused on cornering ability, and hopefully I've done a good reason, do good, done good, excuse me, on explaining why I would put the sliders like this, and why it is, you know, more efficient to run the pass as I do. If you have any questions or wanna, you know, see any other, you know, the side slider builds, let me know. But for now, we're actually gonna jump into research. For research, the way that it works is that you're gonna have to wait until uh, that around the middle of April before it opens up. You'll get a uh, regulation vote. In this case, we have minor technical changes, but this can really be anything. And as you can see here, you get an option to vote. In this case, it's a minus five to anything, uh, anything in this case, minimal or moderate. Some regulations will hit everything. Some regulation will focus on certain aspects of the car. And in this case, we're just gonna vote for one of them. Once you've sent in your vote, it's going to take uh, another week. As you can see there, we're going to get a regulation vote result. And that also opens the research period. You get to know what the other teams voted for, uh, who voted against. And in this case, we get moderation regulation changes. And as you can see here, for every part, every stat is losing 10%. What does this mean? If we go into a boardroom here and have a look, it means that we are actually losing, in this case, 6.33% of our engine cooling expertise. For our airflow middle, 6%, 5.95. And the boardroom here is actually really good at telling you what you're losing. Now, the way that this works is that it takes your current expertise and then removes 10% of it. So in this case, we're losing 68.9%. That is 10% of our expertise, which should tell us that our expertise is actually 689 And... Uh, so forth and so forth. So our expertise is around 70% across the board for the most part. But again, it tells you how much you're losing. And as you do research, it'll tell you how much you've caught up. And that is the important part here. Because the way research works is that it doesn't actually apply an expertise to this year. It applies expertise to next year and can cancel out regulation changes. If I were to do a design project right now, uh, it doesn't matter which one I do, any, any expertise gained I'd lose 10% of that next year, unless I do research to make up for it. So research is incredibly important for that reason alone, but it is also the best way to develop your car because your research will generally give you some pretty decent results in terms of expertise and generally give you more expertise than if you were designing parts. And if you have CFD and internal hours, they are far more useful on your research projects than anything else. 
But the main reason why research projects are going to be far more uh, powerful than design is because since it doesn't take effect until next year, for a research project, it is as it's already lost that 10%. So for this one, as you can see here, we I did say that our expertise was close to 70% across the board. For this one, we dropped down to 60, 61, 59, 59. So for research, this hit has already happened. We've already lost that expertise. And the lower your expertise is, the quicker it goes up, meaning that we get more benefit from doing research than doing design. So what I would recommend everyone in the first season is as long as you are doing well by the board, and by this I mean you get the you know the place the board wants you to, and you don't run into death, you're generally going to be very safe with just doing research for the rest of the year. Is it going to be somewhat boring? Because you're basically just researching? Yeah, probably. But it's going to give you an extremely dominant car from second year and forwards. But keep in mind, again, it can that too can get boring. If you want to do the same that the AI does, the AI does around two to maybe three projects on hard uh, for each part a year. So they do lose some stats from year to year, particularly with regulation changes like this one, which is 10% across the board. Now, depending on where you place your sliders, you can do what we have been doing, which is basically focus on the stats that we, you know, are strong at. And in this case, gain about 3.2, 3.45, and again, gain about 1.5% in the rest. This also basically translates to 1 to 5. I didn't actually go through this. Basically, uh, um, this one goes to, I think it's 3 to 5. This one goes from 5 to 7. So, and this one just goes from 7 to 8. So if you keep that in mind, basically for this one, 55%. Um, basically 5 to 7, 1.2. Translate to 60%. Again, 120 the split on 260, 3 to 5, basically the same thing here, 59 and a half. So that is how you calculate your expertise for these three. Again, 3 to 5, 5 to 7, and 7 to 8. A little bit difficult to understand, but I kind of forgot it, so just mentioning it passing here. You can do this, but generally I would just recommend you get the expertise reduction dealt with, and that will be basically the best way to do your research. And again, it's perfectly fine to do research for most of the year as long as you meet the board uh, requirements so you don't get kicked. And as I said, I'll be having a guide out later, hopefully on race strategy. I've tried to make it, make it a couple of times. It's been scrapped a couple of times because I just feel it's bad. But yeah, we basically can do that for every part, depending on, let's say that in this, in this made-up scenario, we get hit by 30% hit to high speed, 20% to medium, 10% to low speed, no hits to drag reduction airflow. We can then, of course, do something like this where we focus a little bit more on the past that taking hits to try and, you know, cancel out that regulation change. And that would be perfectly fine. Now, as I said, as you do research projects to check where you're at, so you don't have to add them up mentally, you can just go to your board, rules, regulations, and have a look here. So we'll have a look at kind of what you can do with research as an example. Uh, what I did in my first season in the Objective Survive series. In the Objective Survive series, the research line is where bugs, so everything was in the middle, but you can actually specialize it far more effectively now. And if you use Sifty and Wind Tunnel correctly, uh, or, you know, in a powerful manner, you can actually get some pretty insane research projects going. So let's just have a quick look here at what a project with CFD would actually look like. So unfortunately, I don't actually have a save right now with a research project with CFD, but the general thing that you'll be seeing is that you should get a 4 to 5 times as high numbers, particularly as a lower rated team. So in this case, we were getting hit by 10% from everything, doing just a single project, single basic project, and then a project with CFD, full CFD and wind tunnel. Again, you can use five of these on research. You'll get one at the start of the year that needs to be used on design, but the other five can all be used on research if you wish to. You get one every other month. And again, by using CFD wind tunnel time like that, you can actually make up the losses of five parts pretty easily. And as such, you can actually boost most of your parts massively over the course of a full year of research. Again, we'll have just a quick look at that right now. I want to show you a little bit of an example of how research actually looks at the end of, say, your first season. Depending on regulations, this could be different, but as you can see here, this basically tells us that there was a regulation change for the front wing, and we can have a look at our research results. So our expertise gain here, expertise from research was 25%. 26%, 25%, and as you can see here, we made a positive gain, but we also lost some from 
the regulation change expertise loss. So basically here, for this one, we have a positive 0 0.16 kilonewtons, which doesn't probably tell you much. But generally here, that is what you want to do with research. And research, again, this gets added to your stats on the following season. So any research you do in the 23 season will not have an effect on your car until the 24 season. But as you can see here, if you play your cards right, you can have some pretty massive gains. In this case, the rowing, 25%, the side pods, 20%. Uh, 19% for the underfloor and same here for the suspension and this is basically just from us doing a very very research focused uh, research focused schedule basically after we get our first points we do only research in order to make sure that we can actually have a car that is competitive enough to win us the championship in the second season so with sliders of course you can actually focus a little bit more uh, this example is from before the signs were fixed. That is why you see, you know, the same game across the uh, the field there. But definitely, I would like to put some more of the airflow sensitivity into, say, uh, low speed, medium speed cornering here. Would definitely help us more. Same for really the brake cooling, the suspension here to airflow front rather than uh, high speed cornering. So you can imagine that with the slides, you can actually do some more and better stuff. That is it for this guide. If there's anything that is unclear or you're uncertain about, feel free to ask in the comments. I have been using some older saves to kind of show off what I mean, but the main thing that has been changed has been some slight rebalances, but most of the things kind of work the same still. That's it, is the, that is the thing. So you'll still be seeing around the same in terms of the research gains. You can just specialize your research a little bit more now, which is of course really beneficial. In terms of design gains, it is also pretty much the same because the sign has been updated on the states where we tested it. But as you can see, understanding the sign, research and expertise can have huge effects on your car and also understanding what, uh, you know, what you should focus on in your car. Cornering is going to be probably your most important bet. It's the king and queen of uh, the game. Top speed is still going to be important. Your cooling is going to be somewhat important as well as your, you know, ability to follow your DRS. But as long as you have two of, you know, two of three, even just one of three with cornering, you can still make a very, very powerful car and can still enjoy a lot of fun. Now, if you want more information, have a look at Mike's guide. You can find it in the description and top comment. It is actually incredibly in depth and it should answer anything that you really are uncertain about. I am a little bit unsure if he's actually updated it for 1.9, but the, the man is a machine, so I would assume so. Hope you've enjoyed this guide. It's been uh, highly requested and keep in mind that in order to get the full potential out of this, you are going to have to run fairly aggressive strategies. So I'll try and get a basic strategy guide out um, just as a, you know, a, a middle step before I make a more detailed guide for basically every track. But generally, try and run as aggressive a strategy as you can. And what I mean by this is actually incredibly simple. Running as aggressive a strategy as you can in this uh, manner basically means get two stints in, three stints in, two pit stops, three stints, run the tires on attack, use mediums, use hards, um, as many as you can, run them on full attack for the entire race. There's really no real negatives of that. Even if the tires are overheating, you don't see any higher degradation. And running them on attack is going to give you far more time gained from running on attack than the time loss from heat and degradation of the tire. So keep that in mind. Aggressive strategies can really pay off. It is the best strategy right now in the game. And hopefully I'll be having that going out within the next couple of days. Um, having a bit of a calmer week this time around. So looking forward to that. Again, hope you've enjoyed this guide. If you have, please like, comment, subscribe. The standard. And uh, hope to see you around next time. Bye bye.